This is the Prestigious Initiative. Welcome. I'm Chris Bean, and here with me is Chris Kent. Hello, Mr. Kent. Hello, sir. Today, we have a very special guest joining us today, Dr. Fred Petito, the founder of Attain Leadership, an executive life coach and leadership advisor. Dr. Petito, thank you for being here with us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, Dr. Petito, can you start by sharing your journey and what led you to become a leadership coach, particularly focusing on marketing and agency professionals? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thanks again for having me on. Um, you know, I I've, I've have been uh, working in the marketing services industry for over, over 20 years, uh, nearly 25 years, actually. Uh, and um, I've been in you know, C-level and, and department head roles for the last, say, 10 or 15 years. And um, I've, I've enjoyed the work, uh, but I feel like, you know, I kind of reached a, a peak, uh, a, you know, point where I, I peaked out and, and uh, wanted to do something else and do something a little bit more, um, for me, enriching. It doesn't mean it's not enriching work, but it, for me, enriching. Uh, and you know, my partner is a is a therapist who happens to work with a, a lot of executives in big tech and media and you know, we would talk a lot, uh, not specifically about um, some of our clients, but just generally about some of our clients. And, you know, it was just, just in listening and, and talking to it, it, it seemed like, and she agreed, she actually came upon this insight that actually what a lot of these folks need, they don't really necessarily need therapy. They need coaching. They need like practical strategies and tactics to, to deal with um, workplace issues, whether it's conflict or uh, relationships or influence. Um, and, uh, you know, I've always been, uh, very interested in, um, you know, I've used a lot of behavioral science principles in, in my work as a, as a marketing strategist over the decades. Uh, and so I, I hate to say it decades, but, uh, you know, so it, I, I, I've always had a great fascination, um, with the application of, of, of behavioral principles to, 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 to behavioral situations. And I've, I've applied them in marketing. Uh, whether it's about how you frame uh, an offer, uh, how you design an experience, uh, how you sequence messaging, things like that. Uh, and, um, you know, I, so I, I, it's a great area of, I, I think this, it's a great area of comfort and fluency for me. So I, I kind of was drawn to the conversation. Uh, I had just finished my doctorate in marketing uh, and, uh, you know, I was kind of looking for for something. Uh, what was next for me, if you will, a, a, re, a pivot, if you will. And I didn't want to go uh, academic track. I just, you know, not to, I just didn't didn't work for me. I, you know, I just wasn't something that I felt uh, would be uh, would give me what I wanted. Um, it's a tough road uh, if you want to go tenure track. Um, and, and so I, I stumbled upon um, coaching. And uh, lear- the more I learned about it, the more I researched it, the more I thought uh, that it was something that I would really enjoy and something I'd be really good at. So I, I pursued it. And those individuals that you work with, do you find that they are accepting of coaching? Do they reach out to you? Like, how does that, how does that process go? Yeah, uh, I think that, um, so, you know, you asked two questions, actually. How did I get to leadership, uh, co- you know, executive coaching and leadership development? And then the second question was around marketing and agency professionals. So let me, let me answer that question. Then I can give you an answer to your, to that, that <laughs> okay. follow-up question. Yep. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so um, there's two, there's two aspects to the question, right? So there's like marketers and agency professionals. They both kind of work on, uh, you know, in the same domain, if you will, but they have, uh, if you say industry side marketers that work at big companies, whether it's, you know, Pfizer or Microsoft or, you know, you know, whatever. Um, the, the role of marketing has expanded significantly in the last 10 years. Um, obviously with digital digitalization, digital transformation, social media, that, that's all, that's, that's all table stakes. Um, but, um, you know, with, with the pandemic and, and, and with, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a realization among a lot of senior executives that, um, you know, being more customer centric and, and kind of designing your organization and your experience around the customer is a priority. Um, it, it's become a, a more uh, uh, accepted uh, view among a lot of senior uh, CEOs and boards. Um, that that naturally elevates the uh, the role of marketing in the organization because the, the marketer ought to be the voice of the consumer, the voice of the customer within within the organization, and. Um, you know, I think, you know, if you go, if you go back and 
four or five years ago and, 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 and before then you read a lot of the, the management literature um, and you look at the, the, you know, Spencer Stewart, one of the top uh, retained search firms every year would do uh, multiple studies on the C-suite. And every year they show that, you know, the CMO has the shortest tenure, 39 months, 38 months, and compared to the CEO, which is double that, or the CFO, which is double that, you know. So, so there was something kind of wrong with the dynamic between the chief marketing officer and, and, and the CEO and the board and, and the other C-suite. They just, I think that something wrong was it was, was kind of, they were talking different languages, number one. Number two, I don't think the, the collectively the, the CMOs were doing a great job at managing expectations and managing, um, managing up, if you will, and across the C-suite. And, and the issue was, you know, marketing spends an enormous sum of money in many instances. Uh, and, and, um, it's, it's, it, that, that payback is, is murky at best in most, most situations. It goes back, goes back to that quote from, uh, uh, there was a famous quote, um, I can't remember. It was, a, I think it was Wanamaker. I think it was, a, you know, famous quote. He's a retailer in Philly in the 19th century. He said, you know, half of my money uh, that goes to advertising is wasted. I just don't know which half. Right. So, 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 so there's a kind of a little bit of a, con there was a little bit of a conundrum with, with marketers and being this massive cost center, at least perceived as a cost center and not really generating uh, the, 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 the results and the revenue and the income that, that was expected of, of the C-suite. So that was a big part of the, the challenge of a lot of CMOs and a lot of senior marketers. You know, fast forward a few years, and I, I think the pandemic, uh, and you, I'm sure you've heard this in a lot of different places, you know, really accelerated a lot of um, um, digital transformation, uh, you know, kind of really, really uh, disrupted a lot of old business models, business assumptions, business frameworks. And, and, and you know, the customer now is, is, is you know, the, 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 is now more, more um, the focal point of a lot of companies and the marketer has naturally been elevated. Along with that, you have enormous access to data. Uh, the over reliance, not over reliance, the increasing reliance of marketing, marketing technology on tech, on, on, on tech stack. Uh, and so now the marketer has become this kind of over this, 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 uh, kind of this very diverse set of, of functions and responsibilities that used to be, you know, just, uh, communications and advertising. Now they're, now they're overseeing, uh, you know, digital transformation. Uh, data management, They're, they have responsibility for the entire customer journey. Um, they are the point person for now, in many instances, driving the growth and, uh, agenda for these, for these companies. So they've been, they've been elevated in the organization. And, um, I believe that that's a fantastic thing. And I'm, 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 I'm as a marketer, I think that's, I feel really good about that. Um, I, I think that though a lot of you know it, it's an opportunity for marketers to level up their their leadership skills because a lot of marketers uh, become very technical they become excellent technical marketers especially as you look at all the different flavors of marketing search social media influencer you know broadcast um, you know content marketing the list goes on there's so many it's become so complex that um, you have uh, excellent functional marketers who don't haven't really developed the leadership muscles or, or, or the leadership experiences that uh, are going to help help them thrive uh, in a in a C suite. And, you know, uh, and so that's where the that's kind of the catalyst for me saying I'm going to focus on I'm going to focus on marketers and agency folks because the, the level of complexity. Um, the level of, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the exposure they have now is so much greater that uh, there, there's an opportunity there. And, and to be honest, um, on the agency side, um, you know, maybe going back 20, 30 years ago in the heyday of advertising, you know, the big agencies had management training, leadership training programs. They, they invested in developing their people. And they don't really do that much anymore. You know, I, I think the agency business has become... Um, you know, not to criticize, but I think it's become a little bit more commoditized, a little bit more executionally focused. 
uh, and they've kind of certainly a long time ago lost their strategic seat at the table to the management consultants. And so I think there's a there's a there's an opportunity to kind of level up uh, in that regard. And and really, the sense that I'm getting is without the the marketing professionals in the business, the business is going to be, you know, it's going to have a tough time connecting with the the end user for whatever the the product or, or service is because the marketing person is like you said that go between person and you know if those individuals don't have the leadership skills that they need to be able to manage how they interact with the client the, the customers and with the higher ups then that can be a, a tough time for not only them but for the business in, in total yeah absolutely and you know um i think a lot of uh well, customer acquisition is always a priority for for organizations and that's where a lot of the, the marketing budget goes but customer retention is is i would say even more important because um you know the, the key metric for a lot of marketing teams and marketers is, is uh, a lifetime value so you're just spending you know 50 100 200 on customer acquisition and then, then they you churn them off you know three six months later and, and you you know, your lifetime value is, is, is in the negative territory. That's not a good thing. And um, retaining customers, I think, is, is harder than and acquiring customers because you need to then kind of deliver. You need to deliver value. You need to be relevant to them. And, and so um, the marketer, as the voice of the customer, knows the customer. They know what they want. Um, they should know intuitively what they want, or they should know how to go out and learn more about what they want and have the kind of finger on the pulse of, um, of the customer. And, and so, I mean, it's a very exciting, I think it's a very exciting time to be an up and coming a marketer, right? I mean, I think it, it's just so much change in the last five, um, 10 years. And, and, uh, you know, the, the, the scope of influence is increasing. Um, but it, you know, it, it, it's, it's a, it's a challenging, it's a challenging role. I mean, I use the word polymath. You need to be this kind of this polymath that, that, that spans. And if you go on my website, you see this, I, I created this infographic with, uh, of, of this marketer in the, in the middle of these of this, uh, these twelve different um, kind of attributes or, or skills they have to have, and you know you need, to, you need to be you know creative and, and very and very right brain, and you need to know how to tell stories, you need to know how to be an innovator, uh, you need to know how to just disrupt, and, and you know you need to be at the forefront of of of, of the strategy. But then you also need to be a performance marketer. You need to be, you know, you need to be a data scientist. You need to know how to kind of, you know, unpack data and tell a story with data. And so you have this kind of left brain, right brain conundrum. Um, and that's a tough, that's a tough kind of um, uh, portfolio for for some folks and many folks to, to master. No one could really do it all. So I think the the leadership skills are kind of the thing that I think unlocks their ability to be effective as, as a marketing leader. You can't master these 12 different or plus 12 plus areas of expertise, but you could be more persuasive. You could be more influential. You could be, have better, stronger relationships. You, you, you know, you, you could be more authentic. And these are the things that I think are the, are the force, force multiplier for the, for the marketer in this, in this environment where you can only do so much. Yeah, and you know, you emphasize the importance of cultivating a authentic leadership style. Can you explain why authenticity is crucial for success as a leader? Um, yeah, I think that um, that's a great question, and you know, I think that starts with the, the question of like, what is leadership, right? And, and and I think you know, I saw a quote somewhere that I think you know, leadership is is ultimately um, about creating an environment where where people you know, kind of want to contribute to making something extraordinary happen, right? So by, by virtue of extraordinary right there, um, you, you, people need to step out of their comfort zone. They need to be able to um, uh, push themselves past, you know, what they would typically do. And, and, and so if, if you are not um, authentic, uh, you're not going to, you're not going to get that uh, help. Um, and so, you know, when you think about authenticity, um, I, I think there, there, there's a connection between what you believe as a leader and a person and how you behave as a leader and a person, right? So, so I think you, you need to be able to um, kind of tap into those inner values and principles uh, and, and, and clarify them and articulate them in, in terms of your, your vision. And, and something that inspires people. 
And so I think authenticity, um, like I said, it's a, it's kind of like a it's it's kind of table stakes for getting people to do things that they wouldn't ordinarily do to do the extraordinary. Um, and um, the authentic the authentic part com comes from kind of being who you are on the outside uh, as a reflection of who you are on the inside. Um, and because ultimately, I, I do think leadership is about is about a relationship. Uh, and if um, if people don't feel you're being true to yourself, I don't think they're going to feel confident that you're, there's somebody you want to follow. Uh, and and so that's a, that's a big part of uh, why um, um, authenticity is, is crucial. Um, and you know, if you look at if you look at the data. Um, I can't remember what the study was, um, but you know, there's there's a there's a great study out there. Let's see if I could find it and follow up. But you know, like, what are the attributes of a leader that um, are most important to to people on a team? And and it's honesty. Um, and um, when you start when you unpack honesty as you know as as, as a construct, you know. You know, what, this is what researchers do, right? They, you have a concept and they're like, what, what are the dimensions of the concept, right? So when you unpack honesty as, as a concept uh, or a construct, um, you know, authenticity is one of the most important aspects of it. Uh, and, you know, I believe someone because what they say and what they do reflects their values and the principles that they live by. And so... Uh, that's so crucial. Um, and when, so when, when, when leaders act in with authenticity, authenticity, um, it generates trust. And, and, and uh, that, that's why it's so crucial. You know, that's something that kind of reminds me of something I know that we have both heard before from our boss that, that he, you know, he kind of instills this value that he wants us to respect him for who he is, not the position that he has. And I think that right. kind of is the essence of, of leading auth authentically, because you're respecting that person for who they are, not, well, I guess who they are and the, the place that they hold, but not just the place that they hold or the position that they have. Yeah, I mean, it's a good point, right? I mean, I think that, uh, I think especially, uh, you know, as that, you know, we all know there's generational differences uh, in, in um, uh, Gen Z, Gen X and, and, and others, how they all perceive authority and uh, I think that uh, I think the younger generations um, are less inclined to, to follow someone just because of a, a de facto title, uh, and more because of they believe in in kind of who they are as a person and the values that they espouse and and the behaviors that they exhibit. So I, I think authenticity is is super crucial, uh, and you know I think that goes to another point about you know. I think there's this this there's this perception of leaders as being charismatic and you know you know uh, kind of you know on the, on the top of the hill with you know <laughs> and and, and, and uh, 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 I think that's been portrayed in a lot of films and and, and in a lot of you know uh, other places and um, I you know I think that's why I think leadership is 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 a learned skill set right because um, it's not about uh, charisma it's not about you know. Um, uh, personal uh, aura. It, it, it's about these types of things. You know, are you able to be authentic, create, and be honest, create trust in the people that uh, follow you? So I think that's a, it's a really important concept. And I'm sure that the people that are following or trying to follow, they will be able to see through that kind of that gaze or guise uh, if that person is not being authentic, if their if their values and their beliefs are not in line with the things that they you know are portraying or or claim to be portraying. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's like leadership is is difficult. I mean, we talked earlier about you know marketing and how it's changing and and, and how the, you know and, and you know we like to talk about you know volatility, uncertainty, uh, and 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 that's like kind of the defining feature of business, right? It's responding to change and being being adaptive and all those things. And, you know, um, it, 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 it's okay for a leader, you know, a leader doesn't have to have all the answers. Uh, they need to be able to, you know, say sometimes, Hey, I did, you know, I, I I'm, I'm making, I'm trying to forge a path forward based on the information I have before me. Uh, these are my guiding principles and my values. 
am I going to be right? Are we going to be right? I hope so. I don't know. But you know what? We're doing the best we can with with the information we have before us, and we're staying true to our principles and values. And and whether they're successful or not, I mean, I don't think that's really the point. The point is, is that you're 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 kind of sticking to what you believe. Uh, and, and I think that was, you know, that that people understand that you know leaders are not uh, are not infallible. They are fallible. But if you stick to your principles and 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 they're laudable principles, and people believe in them, and, and you deliver on them, I, I think that's I think that's uh, that that is authenticity, and I think that's important. In today's fast paced world, adaptability and agility are crucial. How can leaders become more adaptive or agile in their approach to leadership? Yeah, so so it's a a really great question. And actually, I think there's two, again, two questions embedded in there. (laughs) So, so, uh, which is good. Um, I think, I think, you know, the first, the first kind of phrase you talked about was uh, adaptive, right? So I think, I think, I I think of adaptive as a little bit more, um, there's a behavioral aspect of being adaptive, but I think, I think of it a little bit more as mindset driven. And and agility also is is mindset driven. I think there's also a behavioral piece, more, a little bit more behavioral piece to, to, how you act with agility. Um, I think the um, start with, starting with adaptive, right? I think I think I think that's a little bit a little bit harder thing to kind of cultivate, right? This adaptive mindset, and um, I, I, th- I think this kind of sum it up. Um, it, it starts by by moving from this um, this this mindset of um, from doing to being, from reactive to creative. Right, it, it, the the non-adaptive leader, right? I, I, again, not to criticize non-adaptive leaders, but I think you know they're they're reactive, I, I, and and, and um, you know the the teaching, you know what we've learned from from the adult development, uh, the uh, developmental psychologists and the adult psychologists like Robert Keegan and all of this is that there are different levels of how we perceive and respond to the world. Right, and, and so that's the kind of cornerstone of of of, a, of a da- what they call adaptive capacity, and at, at, at a at a certain level, um, people are reactive. Right, they 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 are if something happens, they react to it, and and their their day, um, the the flow of their mind, um, their uh, decision making. Um, is guided by external events. It's shaped by external events, uh, and um, that that sometimes is necessary in, in a very executional setting. Uh, but as you get more senior in an organization, and you're responsible for driving strategy or making long-term decisions that have you know consequences and, and impact, um, you want to be guided more uh, by your vision, your values, your principles. Uh, and, and so, uh, we, what they call, what what that's called in this developmental psychology literature is this kind of self-authoring mind, right? And so, um, you, you're you're more directed by your vision, your values, your principles, and 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 that that north star, for example, that whatever it might be, uh, and and those while you're not ignoring those those fires, those 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 things that happen on a, on a on an hour to hour day to day basis. You're being guided less by external events, and but being guided more by those internal uh, f- forces, values, vision, purpose, and and, and so that that creates um, uh, puts you in a place where you 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 are able to be more creative. When you look at a situation, you are able to look at it more dimen- with more di- like more dimensionally, if you will, uh, and um, and. So that that's that's a stepwise growth for for you know. So if you're thinking about you know coaching uh, a leader or a new someone who's new to a leadership role where they're confronted with a significant or amount of uh, you know we talk again about volatility, uncertainty, ambiguity, uh, or just things that are unfamiliar with them takes them out of their comfort zone. Um, you know that 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 that's that that's that's a, a way to kind of help them deal with reality and not be so reactive and make bad decisions. Um, and um, the, the way you get there is, and coaching can be very effective, is, is increasing your, your self-awareness and your 
metacognition, right? I'm where, like, how do you think about how you think, right? Um, and so if we're able to kind of zoom out a little bit and actually unpack your decision making or, or your behavior in different settings, uh, it, you, you, you could gain a little bit of insight or a lot of insight into why maybe you, you're bringing a reactive mindset versus a creative mindset to situations. So um, I, that's a very, I think it's a very exciting area of, of kind of uh, executive coaching and leadership development. You know, it's grounded in, in like I said, the development, both psychology, um, uh, literature. Uh, and ultimately, it's all about um, fortifying your thought processes, right? And and, and being able to think more critically and object, objectively and with an independent frame of mind that is guided, again, by your inner principles and values uh, or the stated corporate strategy as opposed to, you know, the, the external event. So so that's that's the adaptive piece. Um, the, the, the agile piece also has mindsets. They also have, you know, there's also kind of mindsets. Um, I take a breather after that. that was <laughs> Well, so I, I'll give you a breather here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As you were talking about being adaptive, it, it we we had a conversation with uh, Jocelyn Herman Sascio, uh, who's a life coach who talks about being unmessable with, and her big thing is is being unmessable with, and it sounds like that being adaptive, being adaptable, or that or that skill of having adaptability throughout whatever it is, is it ties in very very easily with being unmessable with, and really that means that you have a preset mode of being that you are when right. x happens you know why is going to happen because that's that's your your internal beliefs or or, or your driving force and yeah. you want to be in line with that so when this happens and you do this and it also reminds me of and I'm almost certain it's it's from Zig Ziglar but uh, our boss talks about reactive and and responding and yeah the way that I've always internalized that is is from this definition. You know, you go to the doctor, and the doctor says, "Ooh, you're reacting to that medicine. That's not a good thing." Either you go to the doctor, and and they're saying, "Oh, you're responding to that medicine. Responding is so much better than reacting. Reacting yeah. is yeah, it's great. You're you're on your heels. It's not going well. But responding means you're adapting to whatever it is that's going on, and you're able to make those and and then go on from there. And so that as you again as you're explaining being adaptable, uh, those two things really brought brought to my mind. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a great analogy. Um, and I think being adaptive is you're kind of in control of yourself. Uh, reacting is you're, you're, you're again you're being guided by external events. So I think that's a great a great analogy. And I I, um, I think another good analogy or quote is the I think it's the Dalai Lama that says uh, you know don't don't let the behaviors of others disturb your inner peace, right? And that goes to the quote you just said about that other life coach. And I think um, yeah, there's a certain again, and it's like this this kind of metacognition or meta awareness where you're able to. Um, have uh, more objectivity and control over your thought processes, your behaviors, uh, and it's impulse, it's impulse control also, right? I mean, you know, many times being reactive um, um, in a business or any environment, um, you know, there's a self-regulatory aspect to it. You know, you, you need to develop that muscle where uh, you're able to um, hold back and not just react and think through and be a little bit more intentional uh, about your behavior. And it's not easy. You know, it certainly is something that um, requires work and, and, you know, coaching. And, and uh, um, I think it's a very, it's a very exciting area. And, you know, I think, I think the great thing about it is that um, when you're able to think about your thoughts and your behaviors, uh, you're actually able to get great results in, in, in relatively, you know, little time. Making it a habit is another thing, but uh, you know, doing in situationally, I think it could be a really, really great way to get some quick wins with with a coaching client. And you know, I think the hard part about that is is uh, I think it's Jordan Peterson says that you have to watch yourself like a snake, like you're like you're hunting yourself, so you can watch yourself from the shadows, and and then as you're doing that, allow that you know the hunter version of yourself to to see okay why are you making these choices are you in line are you are you lying about this and if so why and and but to watch yourself kind of from the outside to see you know 
perhaps how other people view you and are you making those decisions and, and acting in accordance to, to your internal beliefs and, and, and values. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. It's really good. Yeah. It's like, it's like, that. that's why I think like leadership is a, is a, it is, it, it's a lot, it's science, but it's a lot of art, right? It's about application. Um, and, and I know the second part of the question was about was about agility and I, i'm going to stick to mindsets uh, here i think the we talked about this this shift right this shift from a reactive to a creative mindset i think i think the other one i wrote a blog post about this recently is uh, uh, about a mindset shift from certainty to curiosity you know so being agile um i think in the definition of the very definition of agile is like you, you're able to um, respond with intelligence to the situation that's unfamiliar to you, right? I mean, you know, I mean, um, just doing the rote and, and, and um, responding to things you, you that are kind of, you know, uh, standard operating procedure, run of the mill things you've done over and over again, that, 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 that's not agility, right? That, that's just, you know, doing what you do and, and, and doesn't really, it's not very taxing. Um, but uh, when, when you're confronted with a situation that is unique or, or sui generis, whatever you want to call it, um, you, you, need, you need to bring uh, a, a different mindset. And so this, a lot of times, like, especially executives that are being elevated, you know, they're used to, you know, I talked earlier about like you could be a fabulous functional or sort of technical marketer, right? You, you, you could be brilliant at, at executing. A lot of marketers are. But when it comes to the more ambiguous uh aspects of, 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 you know, leadership or, or, or enterprise strategy, whatever you want to call it, um, you, you need to kind of bring a bigger mind. And, and so that, that's what this shift from certainty to, to curiosity uh, means. And um, I think it's about being more open and exploratory and, and um, embracing your ignorance, you know, like you don't know all, you know, you don't know all the answers. You haven't been here before. Lean into, uh, you, the fact that you don't know something. And um, I think many times uh, that um, will uh, open doors, right? Uh, because uh, you need to step away from like what they call narrow technical solutions and come up with something original. Uh, and if, you're, if you've just been doing the same thing over and over again and you apply it to a new situation, it, it's, it's not going to get you the outcome that 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 you want and also i think i think that um you know the if 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 you if you view the world with certainty if you you know um or narrow mindedness or whatever you want to call it you don't see things threats or or opportunities uh bef before they come right you, you think you know everything you you you, you assume you you kind of got it um got it under control uh, but, you know, as we've seen, you know, business, um, everything, leadership has gotten more complex, more uh, volatile, more um, constant change. And so, you know, bringing that, that, that mindset of curiosity, I think, is, is foundational to being um, more resourceful, more innovative, uh, and, and more agile. Yeah. So that, that mindset, mindset shift you talked about from certainty to to curiosity is really interesting to me because uh, so to me that reads you know you are humbling yourself or you're setting your ego uh, yeah. aside which are are two I think very fundamental parts of being a leader um, so that yeah that that that's a very interesting uh, side of it I have not had not thought about before yeah, yeah you don't know you don't know right yeah, I, mean, right? I think that's just like you know um, and um, I think. I don't know about you, but for me, I've always been inspired by people that didn't necessarily know the answer, but knew how to go on a journey to find the answer. Or right? they were it's willing like, to take the journey to find the answer for you or, or for yeah. themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I, think, I think you said it also. I think there's a lot of, we talk, go back to authenticity. I think when somebody says, honestly, hey, I don't know the answer to that question, but we can certainly try to find out, figure it out. Um, you know that that as opposed to you know faking it until you make it you know i think i don't think that's a <laughs> i don't think that's a good leadership strategy uh and so i think that's a great insight um 
you know, the one, the one final mindset shift. And I think this is a really ex- kind of exciting one. I, I, I've always thought this is another one where you could get some really good, good impact, good pop, if you will, is, is from a, from a fix to a growth mindset or a fix to an abundance mindset. And especially in, um, in, um, I, I've seen this in, in, in mature industries, um, where, well, first let me say kind of what it is. It, it, it's, um, it, it, it's kind of, uh, bringing, uh, you know, reframing things so that you're not limited by past experience or kind of the default response, right? So a fixed mindset is this is how we've always done it. And, and this is kind of, you know, this is kind of how it's done. Uh, and, um, you know, you, you, you limit your ability to see, um, uh, you know, new opportunities, new threats, or, or, uh, and, and I think, I think Steve Jobs was one of the, was one of the brilliant, uh, you know, uh, people at, at this, you know, and, you know, one of the things I remember watching a documentary a long time ago, and it was just, I can't remember where I saw this, but I remember, you know, he, he in the early days of Apple, he hired a, a finance director, or, or the, there was a finance director from an acquired company, um, and, um, and he was saying to the finance director, why do you do this this way? This seems like ridiculous and stupid, to be honest. Um, it just doesn't seem, this, why do you do it? This is, you know, outdated. And, and, and the person said, well, because this is the way we've always done it. And he was like, that, that, that's just, that, that is the, the worst reason to do something. And, and so what he was, he was able to do was kind of challenge this really outdated, um, you know, re- I think it's financial reporting or so. I can't remember what it was, um, but it was just, you know, it's indicative of, of kind of how he approached, you know, everything he did, which was just because something is a certain way doesn't mean it's the best way. Uh, and, um, you know, let, let's find a better way to do it. And, and, and that's that kind of growth mindset, that's part of the growth mindset. Another thing is, is um, Many traditional, I think, many traditional strategists and leaders they view they view things as zero sum game, right? So, so especially in mature industries, I've seen this where you you, you have um, um, a slow growth, low growth. Um, this is kind of getting a little more into marketing strategy. You have a slow, low growth kind of uh, category, um, and one of the strategies may be we're going to take the only way we're going to grow is by stealing market share. You know, we have 11% of market share or our next competitor has 13, whatever. We're going to, we're going to try to steal one percent market share. And, and so this is like this fixed kind of mindset. This is a zero sum game. It's the only place you're going to get another little, just making your pot piece of the pie a little bit bigger. Um, and, and, you know, there are great examples of companies um, that um, were in these uh, that, that didn't, you know, I'm sure if you went and looked at red, Harvard Business Case that Business School Case Studies. There's plenty where companies that kind of fell into that that kind of zero sum mind game, you know, are no longer around, or their market share is significantly less than what it was. But the companies that that are able to say, "Listen, we get it. We're we're kind of this this is fixed, and it's kind of like a fool's game to like fight for share." But what are the adjacent opportunities? What are the um, the the add-on opportunities. What are the things that we could do to to leverage our position um, to to find incremental uh, areas of, of opportunity and revenue? And so, uh, when you start thinking about agile, being being an agile marketer, being an agile leader, um, you, you're you're able to find um, those 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 opportunities. Um, um, and those worth opportunities where you wouldn't other, otherwise be able to if you just kind of get stuck um, in, in this in this belief that there are other avenues of growth um, uh, that you know that 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 that's closed off. So I think it's about the mindset shift here is about about challenging your uh, your old ways of thinking, reframing questions and, and from like what's the problem to what's the possible solution. Um, you know, looking for win-win opportunities, you know, things like that. So it's all about, you know, finding new avenues for growth. And I, I'm sure there's, 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 you know, many, look at all these look at the hundreds of companies that have uh, grown, you know, that, you know, 
Casper disrupted uh, the the mattress business. Airbnb disrupted the hospitality business. Right? They 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 looked at a um, my 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 sister in law works for Warby Parker. She you know she did look at Warby Parker with eyeglasses. They they, they looked at a a, a sector uh, an industry and said you know what's what what is not great. What what could we what what could we do that's better. And when you look at an old, like an, an industry like mattresses up until, you know, 10, 15 years ago, it was not a hard, there's plenty, you know, there, there's not, it wasn't that hard, right? <laughs> the eyeglass, you know, it was Luxottica has 90% of, 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 of the industry locked up, right? They have this vertically integrated, you know, uh, um, uh, monopoly. And Warby was able to go in and say, we could do it for 60, 70% less. You know, we could source our materials and we could do it and, and we could develop our own retail footprint and do it, you know, and so they, they took, they took this kind of growth mindset, this abundance mindset to these established traditional uh, industries and turned them up upside down and made, you know, obviously, uh, you know, they've made trillions of dollars. So I know I, one thing that I have talked about before is, is having a consistent and never ending improvement kind of mindset. And, and with that Mm -hmm. kind of talk about Henry Ford. And so Henry Ford, you know, of course, made the Ford and and he was happy that he made the car that worked, but the vast majority of people couldn't actually afford it from the get go because it was so expensive to produce and they were making so few of them. And so in his thought process of trying to be agile in his business model, he came up with the assembly line. And now the assembly line is how we do everything. And it's not just that these people that are looking outside of the circle to find what they can do differently that it benefits them uniquely, but actually benefits everybody because then all the other people in that industry, they have to grow and adapt and be agile enough to catch up to where they are. And from there, the consumers benefit, of course, because then they get the products that are, you know, the companies are battling it out. We, you know, the consumers, we get the lowest price of whatever it is and perhaps sometimes even better quality than what we had uh, prior to that. So having the agile kind of mindset and having a consistent never ending improvement mindset kind of go hand in hand. And and again, the way I think of that is, is with, with Henry Ford and the assembly line, because that was monumental. That's great. That's a great analogy. That's a great story. Um, Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that, uh, you know, the list goes, Uber, the list goes on companies that just said, Hey, we're, we're looking at a, an industry or a sector and, and there's gotta be a smarter way. There's gotta be a better way. And and that's that, that growth mindset. Uh, and, um, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's a great, that's a great analogy. Very good. Can you, can you, you know, explain perhaps what executive presence is and and share some, perhaps some, some strategies or tips or tactics to develop an executive presence, uh, in the context of leadership? Yeah. And that's like a big, often a big topic for, uh, the executive coaching and leadership development is presence. Um, you know, and, you know, again, I, I taking, taking, bringing my kind of marketer research, marketing research, uh, uh, mindset to this. Um, I think, I think of presence as, as, as kind of a complex cluster of things, right? Attributes, attitudes, behaviors. It, it, it's, it's, um, it, it's not an easy thing to put your finger on. You know, presence is a, um, uh, it, it's kind of a, a, a tough one sing, on a singular level, but I think, I think the, one of the biggest pieces of presence is, is, um, um, and, and, you know, presence is all about your leadership style and, and how you interact with people and, 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 and how you show up. Right. And, and I think, um, I think, so I think that it's, it's a culmination of a lot of different things. Um, but I think, um, one of the most important things or aspects of it or attributes, right. Elements of it is, um, is is influence I, I think influence is 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 a, is a is a is a building block of presence uh i think self-awareness is another building block of presence um and so many times when when somebody wants to talk about presence uh we'll we'll start with influence um because uh it it, it has i think it, it naturally kind of builds to um I think this this more a little bit slightly more elusive thing about presence and presence goes also to how how you present yourself, how you dress, you know, how you your body language, and, and so there, there there's a lot of pieces. But I think if you start with influence, 
uh, I think that gets you on a good path to uh, developing, uh, uh, you know, uh, an executive presence. And, you know, there are many types of influence, right? There's informal influence uh, uh, in terms of different, you know, channels and tools and how you engage people. There's persuasive communication. That's a really big part of influence. And I would argue a really critical element of presence. Um, you know, I think great leaders know how to communicate with uh, persuasively, but articulate things in it. They need, they know how to simplify. They know how to tease out the big picture issues. Um, they know how to express things in a way that people understand them and find motivating. Um, and so, you know, those are the types of things that we would, we would work on when we're talking about presence. Um, you know, also having a compelling vision and strategy, right? Is, you know, for a leader to have uh, presence, they, they need to uh, convey and convince their people that, that they have a big picture uh, uh, and um, they are able to articulate it and, and, and um, uh, people believe it, right? So, so I, I think those, um, th those are the types of things like when people talk about uh, presence, the types of things that we focus on. So I like to break it down uh, into its in, into its kind of its you know component parts, uh, and um, yeah, that, that that's that's how I think of presence. That's how I approach presence. Yeah, and, and really, you know, having the presence as a leader is crucial because without that, then the you know the the followers don't know necessarily who or where you are. You have to have mm -hmm. that presence to kind of bring them on board to get them, you know, on your ship, sort of say, and sail them to a new harbor. I don't know. That's a weird analogy. I understand. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I, 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 OK, I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, you know, it, it, it's just kind of all a culmination of things we've previously talked about. It's it's, it's integrating yeah. all of that into who you are and really, really being who you are and genuine with that and kind of develops that presence. And like we talked about, too, having people respect you or follow you for who you and who you are and not what position you hold. All that kind of ties into that. I think we're talking about presence and, you know, like you said, being that person yeah. that people can look up to and follow for the right mm -hmm. reasons, not just because of mm -hmm. where you are. I would also like argue like for I agree absolutely I think also when you're t talking about coaching folks right I think it's also about um, showing up big at high stake moments right so present you may kind of like it's one of those things where um, you know you, you you can you can you can create a great leadership presence in like two minutes and you could or or take or I should just take that back it, it takes time to create a great leadership presence but you could kind of blow it in in, in, in two minutes right so I think it's um, you know, being prepared and being aware of the moments when um, you're going to, you're going to be able to cultivate that presence. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, I, I, again, I think that it's, it's not easy, right? I mean, I think there's, it's, it, it puts a lot of pressure on people uh, to, um, um, you know, know how and when to show up uh, and, and, and portray or project that, that, that executive uh, presence. And, um I think, like I was saying, like you were saying also, Kent, I think it's all those, um, it's those attributes that make up, that, that all kind of build uh, to collectively, uh, to, you know, present you as somebody who has, who has presence as a leader. I believe that building trust and respect with peers and team members is fundamental. Can mm -hmm. you perhaps share some actionable ways that leaders can earn respect and trust from their colleagues? Yeah, and we you know, we talked earlier. Absolutely, we talked earlier about you know authenticity, and you know one of the one of the key building blocks of authenticity is uh, is trust, um, respect, thing, honesty, and things like that. Um, but when you talk about um, you know you talk about trust and, and respect, I I, I, I like to um, I really like I don't know if you're familiar with um, um, uh, what's their name Kuzis and, and Posner's. Five Practices of Exemplary Leadership. Um, so they, there's this great book um, that they called The Leadership Challenge. Uh, it's by um, it's, it's been around for about 30 years now. I think it's in its eighth edition or seventh edition. Uh, and it's it's two uh, business school professors, uh, Kuzis and Posner. I think Kuzis is at uh, UCAL and Posner is at University of Texas, whatever. But um, 
they've done over 30 plus years, you know, thousands of studies about, you know, what makes for a great leader. And um, the, the they've identified five what they call exemplary practices of leadership. Uh, and the, 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 the model has been um, validated over and over again. Uh, and so I think it's a highly validated, very robust uh, model. And they, they talk about five things. And I think each of these things uh, accrue or create trust and respect, some more than others. So the first one is about modeling the way, right? So, you know, trust and respect, you know, why do you, why do you trust and respect someone? And, and they say, you know, one of the things that leaders need to do um, is they, they need to uh, establish the principles about how we behave and how we act and, 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 and uh, how we pursue goals. And so they have to model that behavior, right? You, you know, I think, I, I think there's a, you know, a lot of leaders that uh, talk a good game, but then don't model the behavior, don't model um, uh, uh, that, those leadership principles. And uh, I, I think that, that is so when you do kind of set that, those principles and you model that behavior and you reinforce it and you, and you encourage people to, to, to embrace that behavior and you reward people for embracing that behavior. I, I think you, you, you generate trust and, and respect. Um, the, the second uh, practice, the first, so the first one is model the way. The second one is it called inspire a shared vision. Uh, and, um, you know, I think this sounds kind of obvious, but, um, you know, having, um, having a vision is one thing. Um, having an inspiring vision is another thing. Right. So I think that, you, you know, I've been in a lot of organizations where there's been a vision and people are really, I don't know what, you know, kind of, that, that doesn't, doesn't relate to me. I, I don't really see it. I don't believe it or I don't know how we're going to get there. So, um, having a, an, an inspired shared vision, right? It's not just a vision, but it's inspiring and it's shared means that you actually do the hard work of engaging people. And, and having, giving them an opportunity to input on it and giving them an opportunity to, uh, and taking the time to explain to people why it's important to them uh, and, and how it's going to be meaningful for them over the long term. Uh, and, and so to get people excited, to have them trust you, you need to get them as um, kind of active participants in, in, I wouldn't say co-creation, but just, just make them, show them how um, the vision is important, why it's uh, why it's it, it's valuable and and what it means to them and and what you know what what they're going to realize from it. So again, you know, vision is one thing, and inspired and a shared vision is another. And I think trust and respect come from 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 that. The, the next uh, uh, practice is about challenging the process. I don't, I don't think that's so much about. Um, that's more about what well, that, that Steve Jobs example before about, you know, we're not, we don't just do things because that's the way we've done them. I don't think that's so much about respect and, and trust, but then the next one is uh, the fourth practice is about enabling others to act. Um, right. So, so the idea here is about, um, and it's close to agile too, right? It, 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 you, you know, you foster collaboration, you build, you build spirited teams, you build camaraderie, um, and a, a mutual sense of being part of something, right? And, and if um, if you if you give people a sense that they have a voice, that there's psychological safety, that every opinion um, you know uh, should be heard, uh, and everybody has has a stake in the process, you're in, you're enabling people, right? You're empowering people, and when you enable and empower people. They, they trust and respect you. When you don't, when you marginalize, uh, or when you don't, and when you do these you know, kind of top, you know, top down type uh, decision making, um, and I'm sure you've seen, you've been in organizations where you know decisions are made, and, uh, you don't feel like you were consulted, or you don't feel like you were engaged. That that, that doesn't create trust and respect. That creates um, distance uh, and distrust. So I think I think again, um, uh, creating that. Um, Impact, that sense of empowerment creates trust, uh, and, and, it, and it, it's it, it's dignified. It, you, you dignify people, and you give you make them feel important. And it, there's a lot of uh, uh, enrichment in, in that. Uh, and so, if you look at the you know the Gallup data, you know every quarter that comes out, uh, employee engagement, 
uh, you know, four fifths of people don't feel engaged and, and, and don't, don't enjoy their work. Uh, and so that's 80, you know, 80%. So <laughs> that's, that's a lot. It's a big number. Yeah. Uh, and, um, I think there's a lot that, that leaders can do to, to, uh, you know, make people feel more, um, um, empowered at work. Plus the fourth. And then the, and then the fifth of the, you know, this is the, the kind of the leadership challenge. Uh, I, I'm certified in, in this uh, leadership challenge. I love it. It's a really robust, uh, uh, um, uh, program, if you will. And the fourth is, it, it sounds very obvious, but it's called encourage, encourage the heart, right? And, and um, the idea here is um, re recognizing people, right? And, and really taking the time to uh, recognize people's contributions, but not just say, hey, Joe or Marianne or whomever did a great job, explaining why they did a great job and explaining how what they did was so important to the business. But even more importantly, how it aligns with the vision, the values, and the purpose that we talked about earlier. Like, so model the way, we, you know, we were modeling the way we're, we're, we're setting a, a principles and values to guide the, the organization or the team. When you um, reward people and acknowledge people for things that, that they do that are consistent with those uh, principles and values, um, it makes them feel, you know, good it makes them feel you know celebrated it makes them feel even heroic right so so it's about unlocking kind of that more um, kind of um making them making them feel emotionally connected to um to the team and to the vision and to the purpose and it sounds like almost each one of those five topics from the leadership challenge kind of reiterate on themselves or, or drive back to yeah. one of the earlier topics just so that they all are cohesive and in, in, in current with each other yeah, absolutely. I think I, I love that model. I think it's, you know, I think that um, I think there's a, there's so many hundreds of books on leadership um, and, uh, you know, most of them are, are great. You know, uh, I don't think a lot of them, though, are evidence based. And the thing I love about the uh, the leadership challenge is, you know, it's, it's evidence based that, you know, these two, these two professors have been doing these, you know, studies now for 30 plus years. It's, it, you know, and, and, and they've got this very robust, you know, uh, data, bit, data set. Uh, and, um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, right there, right, right there for, for leaders to, uh, to, to uh, adopt. But, you know, it's not, you know, just reading the book and, and, and you know, uh, you know, then going out and thinking you're going to be able to apply it is, is a different story, right? Because we all know that. You know, it's like, what's this expression? We all have a plan until you get punched in the face, right? So, 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 you know, uh, conceptually understanding it um, is is different from actually applying it. Because there's so much variability in, in in the world around us. So, if that's where coaching comes in, right? It's it, so that's why coaching is such an amazing um, um, a tool because you know it it helps people to kind of slow down and, and look at. Um, the, the situation and think about how they're thinking about it and how they're acting and behaving around it. So if you have the leadership principles, those five practices as a backdrop, right? And you say, okay, let's look at this, this situation that uh, this leadership challenge or this leadership situation or this work related situation, which, which of these apply and, and what would the, the learning from that, that the great body of knowledge tell us about how it would be an optimal way to move forward. So I, I think that's the value of a coach. You know, I think it, it's kind of the application. And really, you know, as the coach, you might have been hired by the CEO that perhaps read the, the leadership challenge. And maybe you, I, I'm, I'm assuming you meet with them to kind of get a feel for what you, what they want for their team. And then you would meet with the team. And so I think that probably part of of the hard part of reading the book and trying to put those things into action is that one person reads it and they might understand them at, you know, at some surface level and they try to right. apply those, but the rest of the team isn't on board. And so I would imagine, you know, that's where the coaching comes in, where you get to meet with the CEO or, or whoever hires you yeah. kind of, okay, these are the, this is the roadmap that I kind of want for my team. And then you meet with everybody. So everybody's on the same yeah. page uh, yeah. with your coaching. Yeah, we're doing that right now with a team. We have a big team coaching uh, engagement going on, which is exactly that. 
And, and I think you, you nailed it on the head. It's like it's the, the variability of, of, of life, right? <laughs> the variability of, of organizational life, right? You, you, you could you could study something and say this is this is a brilliant thing, and I want to apply it. Uh, then you, when you're doing it in real life, you know that's the art of it. You know, it's, it, you know, it doesn't. It, it's not a one to one translation. <laughs> so there's there's nuance and there's there's different strategies and uh, yeah, it, it, and that's you know, that's why leadership I think is a very um, it's it's a challenging thing. And that's why the book is called the Leadership Challenge because I think that's 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 uh, 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 that, that I think that captures the essence of it. It, it. It's never what you think it is, and it's always something requires uh, additional strategizing and a diff, you know uh, you know judgment. And and you talked a little bit about you know having a vision and, and communicating that to your team, but you know can you speak on perhaps some creative or, or, or some strategies that leaders can use to create that vision and then to actually communicate with that team in such a way that motivates the team to fulfill on that vision? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, um, you know, I like, so I think there's, um, you know, going back to, to how, how, um, they define vision, right? The, the, uh, uh Posies and, and um, Cozies and Posner, it's about inspire a shared vision. So the vision is just this one element. There's, it's inspiring and it's shared. So I think that um, the first thing <clears throat> is, it, is certainly starting with something, uh, a big picture for a compelling future that the team can aspire to, the organization can aspire to, right? So, so you need to, the leader needs to come out of the gate with something, right? They need to, and it could be a, 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 a straw man. It could be uh, something that is uh, for debate. But you need to, you know, years ago we used to talk about BHAGs, you know, big, hairy, audacious goals. I'm sure you've heard that expression. Uh, I think BHAGs are, are, are good unless if they're too, if they're too BHAG, then, then they're not good <laughs> because they're not attainable. And then there's nothing worse than having a goal that's not attainable. It's more, it's more demotivating than not even having a goal. Um but I think having a big picture, a compelling picture for the future, the start um, is, um, is 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 a good first step, right? And it's, it should be a, a insp- inspirational and, and aspirational. Um, y- then you need to appeal to others, right? You need to ask them what it inspires them about it, or what inspires them about the future, right? Because again, it has to be shared, and you know. You guys have been in organizations. You you know that many times the best ideas come from you know the bottom. They come from. I hate to use the word the bottom. They, you never know where a good idea is going to come from. You, you could be a person who's been in the organization for three months. It could be someone who's been there for thirty years. You know, it, it, it's somebody with a with an outsider's perspective. It's somebody with an insider perspective. You know, you never know where a great idea is going to come from. So you 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 need to appeal to others, and and you need to create. Um, a sense of psychological safety, so people feel like they can contribute uh, to 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 that defining and articulating that future. Um, and um, and I, 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 I remember reading this just a long time ago. You know, Anderson Accenture used to be called Anderson Consulting, um, and you know, 15 years ago, whenever that was, uh, there was that massive debacle with uh, uh, Anderson um, Arthur Anderson, where they they. They had some trouble, I guess, when Enron, and you know, they, they had to close the shop because there was, uh, there was fraud or something like that. So the name Anderson was was kind of tainted. And um, so I remember what the, what the senior folks at Anderson Consulting did is they 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 put a survey out to all their people and for a new name. And somebody, you know, a, a, a senior manager or manager came up with this name Accenture, Accentuate the Future, and that's where the name came from. So you know, again, they they were able to go out. And appeal to others, and, and, and we're able to come up with this really, I think, brilliant, um, uh, you know, compound you know, name that that that's been, uh, you know, very successful for them. So appealing to others is 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 a big part of inspiring uh, the team and, and helping them feel like they have a stake in the process. Um, I, I, you know, another thing is, I talked about this, and we talked about this a little bit earlier. Is um, just because it's a, a great vision. From from high on above, uh, or even a shared vision, like how do others feel it, it, it relates to them and their interests, right? I think people need to feel that um, there's something um, that's meaningful to them, 
yeah, everybody has, everybody has to, yeah, it's so funny. Everybody has um, their own relationship with an organization or with the senior management. They, you know, they, everybody kind of personalizes it, individualizes it. So if you give them a sense of uh, being, having a voice um, and, and showing them how um, uh, the common, a, a common vision uh, uh, applies to them and how it could benefit them, I think you're going to have, uh, 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 we'll use the word compliance, but you know, I think there's going to be more acceptance and, and adoption. Um, and I think, I think finally, um, you know, I think, I think it's, it's having a belief and a conviction in the vision, right? So it's like, if you're going to do, if you're going to like, you have an inspiring vision, it's going to be shared. You need to believe it and, and you need to believe it. Uh, and you need to be authentic about it in the sense that this is, you need to show people how it, you know, it's like our vision, our North star is it, we're going here because it aligns with our principles, our purpose. Um, and um, I, I think that higher meaning um, means something to people. And it's interesting the way you talk about that, because we have, we've done a number of episodes about finding your values and, and, and making daily habits and practices and making goals and all of those whole, whole thing. And that really kind of ties into exactly what you're talking about, where the way I initially or the way I, I think about goals is you have an end goal, which is the thing you want mm -hmm. to end up in life with. Like, it's not something that like, oh, okay, today I felt happy. Okay, you can check, be happy in life off, off my list. It's not necessarily it can end on a certain day, but it's where you want to end up in life with. And then you kind of work right. backwards from there. And then from that end goal, you have a smart goal, specific, measurable, attainable, time, yep. all those things. And really that acts as the intermediary and the kind of the milestone to make sure I'm on track and fulfilling on that end goal. And then you go backwards from there and you get daily practices yep. or habits and all yep. of those things in line with one another. And that sounds like almost exactly what you're talking about is as far as the, the business goes, they start with their end goal, then they get the, you know, the milestones and make sure they're in line. And then they have the daily things and all of those things implemented across the range will end them with that big vision or that end goal, right. uh, yep. all together. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I completely agree, I, and I think one of the one of the one of the places that many organizations, especially larger organizations, kind of get lost in 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 the in the, they lose the forest for the trees is they start putting these 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 very complex annual strategic planning processes in place, and and, and um, they 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 lose sight of, and then they start creating these these. Uh, these sub goals, if you will, like you talked to your point, um, that that maybe aren't consistent with that with that big vision, and so it requires discipline, right, to um, keep it simple, um, and um, you know not overtax the team or the organization with with too many sub goals or, or um, things that distract you from the from the big from the big vision. So. I, I, that, that, you know, I think, I think I've seen in, in recent years, um, a lot of big, you know, uh, fortune hundred or 500 companies have kind of simplified their strategic planning processes to, so you don't, you know, you don't get kind of lost, get lost in, in, in all these, um, all the minutia and, 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 you know, simplify things. And I think that's an important aspect of, of vision is keeping it simple and keeping it attainable. Uh, and then single-minded focus on it. And, of course, having a vision applies to growth, and many professionals aim for career growth. Uh, you know, what are what would be some advice that you could perhaps give to um, professionals as far as successfully transitioning to a new role, you know, and, and the increased responsibilities that go along with that role? Yeah, this is, this is, a, this is a great question. Uh, and years ago, I did the uh, executive development program uh, at, at one of the big business schools and um, the a lot of the executive development programs are focused on um, <clears throat> a common a very common this is the common question this is a common scenario right and you have uh, somebody who's come out of you know one of the functions finance or marketing or technology or human resources and now they are a general manager or 
board or group president or whatever they are, and they have responsibility for eight or 10 functions, right? You know, so, so now you're a general manager, you're managing this, this enterprise, if you will. Um, and so the things, um, and this is like the Marshall Goldsmith book, right? You know, what got you there won't get, you know, what got you here won't get you there, right? So the, the point is, is that what made you an excellent marketer, finance person, HR person, technologist, those are not the same skills that make you an excellent general manager or, you know, department head or whatever, right? So that's where the, um, you know, the, the functional technical skills only get you so far. You need them. They're table stakes. You wouldn't get there without them. But now you're not being looked at for your functional or technical skills. <laughs> you're being looked at for your ability to motivate, inspire, support, encourage uh, people. And so this goes, this goes back to the stuff we've been talking about, right? Obviously, authenticity and trust and, and respect. But it also goes back to, and you know, I'm a big fan. I mean, the, the research, again, is, is so robust that, you know, the, all the emotional intelligence uh, research um, um, around, you know, what makes for really effective leaders. And I, I think it's, uh, I think that's a really, um, uh, that's a really good place to anchor when you think of about um, how to help somebody kind of step into that, that, that leadership role that increased responsibilities. Um, that's, and it goes to about, you know, their own self-awareness, um, their ability to, to kind of regulate their, their emotions and, and their, and, and, and like you said earlier, kind of have that, um, I can't remember the person you said who talked about like having that restraint or that, that, that meta awareness of, of your thoughts and feelings and, and behaviors. Um, it's, uh, Big part of it now is about relationship management, uh, and and um, on multiple fronts, right? You got to manage up, maybe a little bit differently. You need to manage down differently. You need to manage across the organization. If you need to uh, have, if there are peers and other, you know, divisions or functions you need to partner with. So it's about you know now developing those 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 supportive relationships that are going to be critical to to your success, um, and. Um, you know, conflict also becomes an important part of, uh, yeah, as you, as you move into in roles of increased responsibility, there's, there's, it's not unnatural, uh, to have, um, you know, uh, to be exposed to, to more conflict, right? You know, with, with, uh, you know, how you, your team works, what division works with a, an, another team or division, uh, or, or maybe there's conflict on the team or, you know, so th these are the softer, I don't want to say soft skills, but these are the skills that, um, I think are important when executive moves from again, you know, getting more responsibility. But as a, I, I think, I, I think kind of that also means that your functional technical expertise is 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 less important, and your ability to kind of perform well in these other kind of domains, these leadership domains, are more important. And so that, that those that's you know that's that's a, a big area of coaching as well, and a really important area of coaching. Well, Dr. Petito, I, I want to say thank you for sharing your expertise and insights uh, on leadership. Uh, but, you know, before we wrap up today, do you have any, any key thoughts or, or takeaways you'd like to leave our listeners with? Yeah, no, I think, um, I mean, I, 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 it's, I mean, we just spoke for almost uh, an hour and uh, 15 minutes. So it's clearly a, a very, I think, a very exciting area of leadership development, executive coaching. I think that, um, uh, I think the more you look at it and the more you think about it, um, the more you realize it, it's not uh, monolithic, right? It's very nuanced. There's a lot of dimensions to it. And uh, I think there's a lot of value in working with um, and self-educating yourself and continuing your self-growth, but also working with, with an executive coach or leadership development professional, I think, is, is, is very valuable because um, there are uh, techniques, there's frameworks, there's 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 methods that uh, uh, I, I think can make people uh, more effective uh, leaders, more effective managers, and um, not only drive better you know results for their company, but also give them more enrichment in, in fulfillment in their job, in their career. And and if one of our listeners wanted to get in touch with you to have them uh, to to be coached by you, you know where how could they do that? Yeah, attain attain leadership dot com um, on LinkedIn. Uh, Fred Petito, Attain Leadership on LinkedIn. Um, yeah, uh, that's the best way to reach us. Uh, Fred at AttainLeadership.com. 
Very good. I'll be sure to leave those in the description for the episode as well. Uh, so that brings us to the end of another uh, thought-provoking episode of the Prestigious Initiative. A big thank you again to Dr. Fred Petito for joining us today and shedding light on these essential leadership topics. If you found this episode valuable, please consider subscribing, leaving a review, and sharing it. Remember, leadership is a skill, and you can cultivate it to advance your career and make a difference. Until next time, lead authentically and inspire others to greatness.